Hello there, welcome to Uranium Report for November 2023. The last time I made the Uranium Report public here on YouTube was all the way in May. Generally though, we have nearly monthly Uranium Reports at myfinanceteacher.org. So for more details, if you are interested in energy sector, including Uranium, which have done very well over the last few months, you gotta join us at, again, myfinanceteacher.org. In today's Uranium Report, we are starting with International Uranium Fuel Seminar, which took place in October, where um, some of the presenters, including Kevin Henderson, Senior VP of Duke Energy, that's a major US utility company, highlights significant hurdles in deployment of new nuclear technologies and plants, including supply chain issues and lack of skilled workers. On a bright side, though, the challenges are due to rapidly growing demand for nuclear. For example, Duke's Energy's fleet includes 11 reactors, that's around 12% of all of the reactors in the United States. And the company is aiming to build another 600 megawatts of new nuclear capacity by 2035. Again, an example of growing demand. Another presenter there, Jonathan Hinz, the president of the leading uranium consultancy company, UXC, presented some of the following critical data on uranium. The data points include the following. The US inventories, for example, have dropped from 128 million pounds to only 104 million pounds over the period since 2016. So currently US inventories covers only about 22 months going forward. In the 2023 survey of nuclear generators, 50% said that they will increase inventories in the next one or two years. And only one of the 16 polled plants answered that they're going to reduce their inventories. Again, that's an example of growing demand. And the situation is somewhat similar in Europe. EU inventories have dropped from 142 million pounds to 93 million pounds all the way since 2014. EU inventories now cover around 39 months going forward. Producer inventories are also down. Most producers are holding around four to six months of delivery commitments. And even the utilities in Japan. Since Fukushima, Japan has actually lent some of its inventories to producers. In future, as the producers return those inventories, the supply might actually tighten a little further. As you might be aware, Chinese uranium demand is growing as well, and it's expected to surpass US demand by the end of the decade. Since 2001, China has imported 800 million pounds of uranium, and it has consumed almost 300 million of those pounds. China's demand is expected to grow by 21 million pounds per year in 2023 to 104 million pounds by 2040. The Alashanko warehouse on the border of Kazakhstan and China will hold about 20,000 tons of U-08 uranium. That's about 52 million pounds. That amounts are expected by 2025. This sort of strategic reserve of Chinese uranium will eventually receive more uranium than any other single location around the Earth. China and physical funds like Sprott Uranium Fund have also acquired most of underfeeding secondary supply. For more on underfeeding versus overfeeding and how it creates additional supply, see our report from May 2022, linked down in the description below. Generally, as you see from all of these examples above, demand has grown significantly over the last couple of years and is expected to grow much more over the next decade and beyond. Now looking at what's happening to supply side of the market. In late September, Kazatomprom, that's the largest producer in the world, announced yet another large deal with China. For the details of the previous huge deal, see our report from May 2023 also linked down in the description below. Again, for much more details, join us at myfinanceteacher.org. This time, the deal is with SNURDC, another Chinese company, and this deal will also require shareholder approval as it's a huge deal. The deal would cover more than half of the total book value of Kazatomprom's assets. So China is buying enormous amounts from Kazakhstan, which will shift uranium supplies eastward and will have long-term consequences for Western buyers, and even for investors as yourself. In another recent news release, Kazatomprom expects to increase 2025 uranium production by 6,000 tons, or by over 15.6 million pounds, versus the plan for 2024. 
that would represent already 100% of the 2025 total allowed levels of the subsoil use contracts. This increase actually might not provide much slack to the supply side though as much of the increase in production will come from two large new mines that are actually joint ventures with uh, French Orano and with Russian Ross Atom. Both will need their shares of uranium. Orano has to cover the interruptions from Niger and Orano has to return the uranium it had borrowed from Cameco. Russia will also need its share of uranium from Kazakhstan. It has its uh, large existing commitments including 18 reactor exports in various stages of construction at the moment. These builds will use the uranium from those joint ventures in Kazakhstan. As I mentioned, the slag in supply might not be that big. Besides, Kazatomprom might not even reach its 2024 and 2025 planned production. For example, looking at Q3 numbers this year, production updates shows that uranium production has actually decreased by 5% year over year. That was due to some issues associated with limited access to certain key materials, certain key assets. Moreover, the 2024 guidance decreases capex by around 9%, which will also make it difficult to reach their planned production increase. Moving on to Cameco, the second largest producer. In October, Cameco discussed the Q3 2023 numbers in an earnings call. Production was 3 million pounds versus the expected 4.6 million pounds and sales were 7 million pounds versus the expected 8.4 million pounds. So as you see, Cameco's production is falling behind a little bit as well, adding to the tightness on the markets. Cameco also increased cost guidance to around 52 to $53 Canadian dollars per pound and Cameco's delivery commitments exceed their current production levels, which might maintain an upward pressure on uranium price at least in the short term. So as you see with demand growth and supply shifting away from the West, it's not a surprise that deficits might be expected in the future. Goring and Rosenquag, natural resource consultants, recently reported that the cumulative deficit into 2023 will likely exceed 250 million pounds. That's the uranium that the utilities will need, but they haven't made sure of the supplies yet. Deficit over the next five years into 2022 is around 200 million pounds. This existing forward deficit or uncovered needs of the utilities will fully absorb any Kazatom Prom's increased uranium production over the next five years. These deficits could force the uranium price higher by as much as threefold over the next few years. Nevertheless, utilities, these are nuclear generators, will buy uranium at any price. They're not in the business of trying to buy uranium cheaply. They're not in the business of trying to time the market. Out of total generation costs, that's uh, out of the total cost of electricity, nuclear fuel overall is around 15 to 20 percent of the costs. That includes the conversion and enrichment costs. So the cost of uranium U308 itself is less than 5 percent. So even if uranium price triples, Utilities will still buy uranium, which will make up roughly, say, 15% of generation costs or 15% of your electricity costs. All right, so, so far, these are our review for the demand growth, the shifts in supply side, and the consequent deficits already taking place. Moving on to the developments on the market, long-term contracts are picking up as often they do into the end of the year. So far this year, the contracts on the spot market have already purchased 45.7 million pounds of uranium globally. And with the long-term contracting, the purchases made up 151.1 million pounds. That's uh, the first year since uh, all the way in 2011, where the purchases are already exceeding, say, 120 million pounds a year. But we are far from the peaks yet. The replacement purchases, uh, the purchases required to replace all of the inventory declines, are around at least 180 to uh, 200 million pounds a year. So over the next one to two to three years, we still might see as large columns as we saw all the way back in uh, 2005, 2006, 2007 and so on. Moving on to the physical uranium funds. 
In early September, Sprout announced that in future they might have a limited redemption provision for certain industry players. This provision will result in a bit of a bid for the spot shares when it's trading at a discount especially. That's a discount to NAV to the net asset value. Hence providing perhaps some support to the spot share prices. Another upcoming physical uranium fund is uh, ANU Energy. We've discussed this Kazakhstan-based physical uranium fund with the members at myfinanceteacher.org a few months ago, so again, make sure to join us. It looks like ANU Energy is a little bit behind their schedule with raising the capital, but perhaps ANU will launch its uh, next two phases of their planned 100 million and even 400 million capital raises during um, 2024. Uh, with an expected IPO perhaps somewhere in the middle of next year. And following these uh, physical funds such as uh, Spot, uh, Yellowcake, ANU and others, yet another uranium fund called PFYN might be launched soon out of Singapore. Its launch size is rumored to be up to uh, $500 million. And the fund is advised by Askar Baterbaev, the former COO of Kazatomprom, again the largest uranium producer in the world. And moving on to the uranium purchases by a couple of the largest uranium funds, that's uh, Spot and Yellowcake. As the chart shows, Spot and Yellowcake accelerated their recent purchases after a pause all during summer. Spot is uh, usually able to raise capital and purchase uranium whenever it's trading at a premium to its uh, NAV net asset value. Yellowcake, though, usually buys once a year for $100 million from Kazatomprom. Next, moving on from the markets in the physical funds to the markets in conversion and enrichment. Enrichment has recently attracted attention both in the US and in the European Union. In late October, Bloomberg reported that the US government has requested $2.2 billion for domestic uranium enrichment to address the ongoing concerns. Bloomberg also reported in October that Orano will spend 1.7 billion euro, or around 1.8 billion dollars, to expand their uranium enrichment plant in southern France. So it's nice to see that the realization is there about the importance of conversion and enrichment. Moving on to the market price details, in a few of my previous uranium reports I mentioned that uranium price was going to catch up to the prices of conversion and enrichment that already had doubled during 2022. Again, see those previous uranium reports at myfinanceteacher.org. So far, that's exactly what the uranium price has been doing during 2023. It's been catching up. It has risen by around 60% since the beginning of the year, especially over the last few months. In the next few years, rising long-term contracting from nuclear power generators and spot purchases from physical funds will likely continue moving demand upstream into uranium itself. Next, moving on to some of the recent developments all over the world, starting with the West. In late October, the EU Parliament's Industry Committee, that's ITRE, added nuclear energy to the list of uh, net zero technologies. The law states that uh, such technologies will be eligible for faster permits and less oversight from the EU competition authorities. Among more realizations by the government agencies, in mid-October there was an announcement of a new partnership between the UK and Sweden, uh, this uh, UK-Sweden strategic partnership. According to the partnership, the UK and Sweden acknowledge the importance of nuclear power plants and they will collaborate on civil nuclear technology. And moving on to Germany, there are recent reports that around 15% of German solar capacity is often failing. Luckily, these failures don't rob Germany of much energy because uh, 10 gigawatts of solar capacity produces very little power due to a low capacity factor. Capacity factor is the ratio of actual power generation over the theoretical maximum. Here again, the nuclear energy has a huge advantage with the highest capacity factor above 93%, well ahead of natural gas with 57% in second place. Next, moving on to Hungary, Foreign Affairs and Trade Minister of Hungary recently said that the groundwork has started for the sixth unit at the Pax nuclear power plant. And lastly, moving on to the developments in the East, I've already mentioned uh, large purchases in China, purchases uh, mainly directed 
at the supplies in Kazakhstan. Moving on to Japan, in September, Japanese Takahama 2 nuclear power plant resumed operations. It's already the 12th unit to restart since Fukushima. While most of Japan's 33 operable reactors are still offline, those will still be turned on over the next one or two years, adding much more to the demand for uranium. Takahama 2 is the third nuclear power plant in Japan to operate beyond 40 years after receiving a permission for life extension. As I've just mentioned earlier, some Japanese nuclear utilities have sold their uranium inventories in recent years after the Fukushima. Now, these life extensions up to 40 years and beyond will require them to purchase for a longer lifespan and to replenish the inventories. So there's plenty to expect for nuclear industry and for investors like yourself. Hence, for much more details, make sure to join us at myfinanceteacher.org. Have a pleasant weekend. Bye-bye.